I mean, you, you heard this, where I'm coming from to some extent from the intro. It's somewhat embarrassing for me, <laughs> intro, because uh, I, uh, you know, people describe what I've done in two different ways. The good description uh, I've had to date is when somebody called me the Gorbachev of education. <laughs> <laughs> But the, but the one that I think is more accurate is uh, another one which I heard uh, down in Australia, which was, I was described as the Tarzan of education. <laughs> 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 so why is it that way? Because um, firstly, I have absolutely no formal uh, knowledge of education at all. Um, I never studied it as a subject. And uh, um, I studied physics. Um, Having said that, uh, there was an interesting connection that might, uh, that might interest you. Uh, my father was in education, and he, uh, had a, 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 he did his PhD in uh, Chicago under a, a very famous man, Benjamin Bloom, mm -hmm. in the times yeah. when people yeah. used to talk about um, uh, you know, objective-driven education. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to do the following. And then we test for that, and if you are able to do the following, then it's done, that, that bit. So, uh, so not that I had any interest in that, because that's what my father used to do with Bloom. Uh, and, uh, and there used to be this uh, string of rather peculiar characters who used to come to our house. And I had no clue who these people were, except that uh, you know, every so often my father would say, you must really meet this, uh, this person. You know, his name is Adler, or, or things like that. <laughs> you know? and that. That kind of thing. And I was like five or six years old. So, <laughs> so then I went on and I decided that I would do anything but whatever my father does. So I did physics. I did theoretical physics, which is about as far away from there as it could possibly go. And then I will describe to you what happened, because somehow I stumbled back into education. And the way it happened was that I did my physics, I got my PhD, I came out as working as an engineer. Uh, my boss said, you've got a PhD, you really ought to teach other people how to write computer programs. In those days, you know, physicists were the only people who knew how to write computer programs. So I used to teach that. And so now for the first time I had to teach somebody. So I said, well, this is simple, I just write on the blackboard, I'll do whatever teachers do, and uh, teach them. Um, <coughs> It went all right, except that I had this very plush office in Delhi, and just outside was a slum. And I used to think, I'm trying to make rich people's children into good quality programmers, but how many good ones am I missing back there, the ones who we don't care about? And I, I think you'll agree that that problem is not just an Indian problem, it's increasingly a global problem. What about them, and how many kids are we missing? who might have changed the world if, if we knew how to do it. So it used to trouble me a great deal, and I didn't know what to do about it. And I said, you know, I used to think to myself, well, I, I, I'm not a, you know, a social changer or anything like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy a computer and give it to them. And people said, well, for what for? Uh, they, they, they wouldn't know what to do with it. They'll probably break it or they'll sell it off. So I said, no, I want to see what happens. So I gave it to them. and. Uh, is that the quicker? And what happened, I'll, I'll come to very shortly. Um, so now here's my take on education, first of all. Everybody knows what that is, uh, which is unfortunate. You know, if, if, I showed you, if I showed you a piece of modern physics, everybody wouldn't know what that is. They would know the old one. But how come we know that exactly? So I started tracing back to, you know, one of the things that uh, is funny about this picture is that if I said to you, can you, can you put a date on it? You'd put a date which is within the last 300 years somewhere, ever since photography was invented. <laughs> you'd say it's somewhere there, it never changed. Um, who decided that it should be that way? And I couldn't find any documentation anywhere. So I made it up. I said, there must be a way to figure out who invented the classroom and why and when. So I first started looking at when. 
and when took me back three or four thousand years, then took me back five, six, seven thousand years. It's always the classroom. So why? I mean, we just take it for granted, this structure. Why? And, and this structure explained the whole thing to me, actually. It's because you want to listen to what I have to say. You're not reading what I wrote. You're not uh, taking home a video on a stick that you can watch at home. You want me to be live and you want to listen. So I said, okay, now that gives us a first clue. This happened before there was any paper. So, so you had to call the fellow, whoever you wanted to learn from, and you say, okay, now stand here and tell us what you know. So then, how big a space could you use? Well, it depends on what the average fellow can throw his voice at. It would work out to about a room about 20 by 30. I looked up the physics of, of the voice and it said 20 by 30. So I said, okay, we've got the size of the room. And how many people can sit there? Well, there are simple civil engineering calculation tells you anything between 20 and 30 people. Okay, so now I've got a room, I've got 20 and 30 people inside, just because it's possible to speak without any aid to that many people. And for how long can a person speak continuously? Well, if you look up the medical data, more than an hour your voice starts cracking up. So we will have one hour periods in classrooms which have between 20 and 30 people, <laughs> and there will be it's lasted for 5,000 years, you know, just that, uh, that, that design based on a human voice. Uh, okay, then examinations, how shall we examine? Well, obviously, if it's 20 people, at the end of whatever, um, a month, two months, I'm going to call them individually or in a group, and I'll say, tell me the answer to this. And you'll stand up, and you'll tell me the answer, and if you're right, we pass, otherwise we, we do all sorts of corrective things. So that was the system, until paper got invented. So when paper got invented, things started changing. Because imagine that in the oral age, if you were preparing a, a primary school uh, child, you would say to the, ah, yes, this is also important, what will that teacher say to these children in that situation of oral transmission? Sit, do not talk, pay attention, listen carefully and remember what you hear. These would have been the instructions. They are the instructions even today. Okay, uh, sit, listen carefully, don't look to, uh, towards your neighbor, etc. So when paper came in, what would that primary teacher have done? The primary teacher would now say, well, never mind about how you speak. In the oral examination, she would have taught the child, speak clearly, answer when you're spoken to, etc. She would now say, no, no, wait, uh, that's important, but never mind that. You must have good handwriting, because if, if people cannot read what you're writing. So, and you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time trying to memorize. Write down carefully whatever that man is saying. So the primary teacher's attitude would have changed just because of the introduction of a single piece of technology, paper. Paper and the writing instrument. So then, that went on for another several thousand years until the Germans made the printing press. So now, that fellow who you were calling, he said, we don't want you anymore because we've read your book. <laughs> so, so why do I want you now? So now the teachers had to quickly reconfigure and say, no, you don't need me to talk all the time, but you do need someone to tell you which books to read. So I will tell you which books you have to read, because books don't tell you what's in them until you read them. Well, now jump to today, and books are no longer physical objects. They do say what's inside them quite easily, and they do one more thing, they point to each other. So like the teacher who would say, read this book first and then read that one, well, you don't need that because the books now point to each other. And, and you can, if, you, if you know how to follow the track. So it kind of gives us this 5,000 years of history. Just, it tells us quite easily what we should be doing. We need to be able to tell children in that hugely pointing to each other information space, how to go from one point to another. What's the efficient way to do it? Unfortunately, most of us don't know it ourselves. 
So we have to find a way to teach ourselves. So, so it reflects on all sorts of things, teacher training, approach, and so on. Another, th another mystery in particularly primary education. So we saw the introduction of technology ch change things. Did our forefathers a thousand years ago or 500 years ago, did they say that assistive technology should not be given? I found to my surprise, they said just the opposite. They said use straight edge rulers, use protractors, use set squares, use compasses. In other words, use everything that they use to do their engineering and their measurement inside the examination hall and then show us that you can solve problems. Somewhere along the line, oh, they went further. They said, when logarithm tables came in, they said use logarithm tables, use slide rules. They never said assistive technology should not allow, be allowed. So why did we, at a certain point in time, decide that this is it? After this, no more technology. So you cannot bring your tablet phone into the examination hall. You cannot bring the internet into the examination hall. So I wonder now that if we could go back 500 years to those forefathers and explain to them, wouldn't they have said, why are you doing that? Why are you not allowing them to use the tools that they will use in life inside the examination hall? If you just construct a world where examination halls allow the use of the internet, it will cause, according to me, the same change to teaching as the introduction of paper did. You know, because the, way, the examiner, the way you write questions, it will have to change. There's no point in asking a factual question which Bing or Google can tell you in a second. So you have to ask a different question, etc. So let's take a look at some of that. You're familiar with this, children marching, you know, for whom? I took this picture actually in a school in India and asked the school principal, who were they marching for? I mean, George the fifth or sixth or which one? <laughs> and, and he said, no, 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 they're all gone. I said, but why are they marching then? I mean, are they all going to go to the army or what? I mean, who are they going to fight? So, so he didn't have an answer, but he, he saw the point, I think. You've seen this. So it's quite familiar. Uh, in my time, it used to be called a tired child. Today, it's a child with ADHD who is to be medicated immediately, okay? I cannot believe that. I can't even begin to understand how you can go and medicate that girl so that she'll wake up like a robot and start reading her book. And what point is there in doing that? Why would we not ask the question, why is she sleeping? And the answer will be not with her, nothing to do with her brain. The answer will be with us, the, the, the things that we do. In an American meeting, I, I said, uh, I had ended this bit by saying, therefore, we should be medicated. But the Americans said, no, no leave that one out. <laughs> so, so I made a little list of things that we know. This is one piece first. It's difficult to get good teachers to remote places. Um, I have a little experiment, published experiment. This is uh, Indian data. Science, mathematics, and English scores in primary schools as you go further and further away from New Delhi into rural India. And you see the downward graph. What's the reason? I went to the establishment to ask the admin people. And uh, they, you, I mean, you won't believe this. And I'm lucky there's no Indian apart from me in this room. One of them actually in private said, you know, they get more stupid as they get more rural. <laughs> so, so I said, you can't believe that, you can't say that, you know, there's no data which supports that. So I went to find what the reason was, and I found it with just one question. The question to the teacher, would you like to work somewhere else? Okay. As you go from, uh, to, in Delhi, they said, no, it's fine, and it's a nice big city, you've got good health care, good entertainment, good, good everything. The suburbs, no, we don't want to go anywhere. It's even better. I mean, it, it, we don't have the traffic jams of Delhi, but we have Delhi is only 10 miles away. You go a little bit further, I say, yeah, it's a bit of a drive, you know, it's 45 minutes to Delhi. I wouldn't mind going a little bit up close. 100 kilometers away, I say, yes, I'm trying to get a job in Delhi if I can. 200 kilometers away, anywhere but here. <laughs> okay, so it's a geographic remoteness and teacher migration. And then when I went back to the Department of Education, 
they grudgingly said, yes, teachers migrate away, the good ones migrate away. I mean, if, if teachers try to migrate, obviously the good ones succeed. So what are we going to do about it? I asked the government. The government said we will do teacher training to level the playing field. We'll make the poorer teachers better. So I said, you take a teacher over here, 250 kilometers from Delhi, and you train her, and she becomes a really good teacher. What do you think she'll do next? <laughs> she'll get a job in Delhi. <laughs> so, so that's not going to solve your problem anyway. So uh, teacher training is not a solution to remoteness. When I came to England, then I thought, OK, I'm not going to see this problem. Here's a developed economy. So obviously, the, the rural areas are just as developed as the urban ones. Some people actually prefer living there. And when I looked at the GCSE scores, the, the school leaving certificate scores, um, they were, you know, they were, th there was no obvious geographic correlation. But there were some good ones and bad ones. So I started looking for what's the reason for that, and I found the correlation. In England, the GCSE scores, were, if I plot them against a, a, a peculiar number, the density of council housing, you know, council housing for poor people, for alcoholics, the density of that, the places where there are lots of them and places where there are not so many, and you get the same graph as in India. I started going to those places to look at what they look like, and it was obvious what the reasons were. There were drug problems there, there was graffiti on the walls, dirt on the floor. Why would a good teacher with little children, perhaps, want to teach there? So I started talking to the teachers, and apart from a few dedicated ones, I got the same answer as in India. So yeah, you know, it's, it's not very safe. And that's one factor because of which I'd like to move to the posh areas. So, but this is a social problem, and it's there, I think, in every single country. I studied it in the United States. It's there in the inner city ghettos. It's there in the deserts. It's there high up in the mountains. Um, and it causes a rift in society. And it causes the rift which all of us know, which is that the rich people in the nice places do better and the poor people in the not so nice places who feed the rich people in the nice places, they do badly. So I published all of that, and I did an experiment, which you just heard. So I won't go into that in a great deal of detail, but it basically was exposing children to a computer because of a very simple reason. Computers don't care where they are. They will work the same way in a remote place as they will. So if I can keep them running in a remote place, and that's easier said than done, then they will work the same way. And I found quickly that children can teach themselves how to use it, even though they don't know the language, they've never seen it before, and so on. So groups of children can learn to use the internet on their own. Uh, this is a 14-year-old result. At that time, people didn't think that this was possible, so they wanted a lot of data. Because they said, you know, children will only waste time with a computer if unsupervised and by playing games. I wanted to see if this is true, and the actual truth of the matter was that it is not true. Provided the computer is in a public space and it is unsupervised, these are very important factors. A child alone with a computer will repeatedly play the same game over and over again. If there are a group of children and somebody tries to do that, the rest of the children immediately say, don't waste time. We want to do other things on it. So there is a good high variety of games. Even that doesn't help. After a while, they get bored of that and they start looking for things. They start looking for all sorts of things, including something like this, a seven-year-old, a group of seven-year-olds looking for the word arthritis. <laughs> so what are you looking for that? No, we're trying to figure out if they'll get a pill. So wh why do you want a pill for arthritis? So because grandpa has a problem, you see. So, so then I said, yes, they do want to help, except that we never let them. We think, we'll say, no, you can't do this. You'll, when you grow up, you'll find out all this. If I remove the, those factors, in other words, if I remove the adult, the child is different. I don't see them falling asleep. I don't see any ADHD. I see a lot of energy. But more about that in a moment. Um, but here's just a glimpse from the experiment that eventually got called the hole in the wall. This was the first day. You can see this girl scratching her head, wondering what it is. Because you know this is back in 1999. 
and uh, and then after a few hours they would start to uh, teach each other how to browse that's how on earth are they doing that and they said you know there's an arrow in this and you can move the arrow with your finger I said, all right they figured out the cursor it's the arrow pointing so what I said and then they said the arrow turns into a hand at certain points. So I said, okay, that's very good, you figured that one out. And so then what happens? And he said, then you have to hit the pad, you have to hit it like that, so that the hand can touch, that's in Hindi, they said, so the hand can touch that, you know, the hot spot. And I said, and then, and then I couldn't understand what they said, because they said, and then Shiva plays his drum. So I said, Shiva, you know, Shiva is an old Hindu god. So Shiva plays his drum. <laughs> you, I mean, you can hear it. He said, no, 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 you can see it. I'll show you, he said. And he moved it to a hot spot and he hit it. And the hourglass started. And the hourglass is an unknown symbol in India. But Shiva does have a drum. And it looks like an hourglass and he plays it like that. <laughs> so I said, okay, so Shiva plays the drum. And then what happens? So whenever Shiva plays the drum, something else will happen. But you have to wait. So they've gotten to the, the fundamentals of the operating system using a mythology that they had created for themselves. And I thought to myself, why not? Isn't this what Piaget said children should do? So why, they've done it with a big piece of equipment, so good for them. I measured this whole process over a nine-month period, and in those days the result we found was the groups of children left unsupervised with a computer will, in a period of nine months, get the same uh, computing literacy as the average office secretary in the West. Okay, word processing, <laughs> the spreadsheets, this, that, the other thing. Unbelievable, but I, you know, people used to come from all over the world to, to see this, and, and always they used to ask, are you sure nobody taught them? And I said, no, they taught themselves. And it's a process we don't use much. So I published all that, that's also published. We know that groups of children can learn most things on their own. Now that's a big, big thing to say, but I'll tell you why I'm saying it. Um, we did lots of experiments in those days. First of all, we measured uh, their, uh, their computer skills, which I showed you. That, that was a clear illustration. Then some of my colleagues started measuring mathematics simply by pointing them towards little math sites. And the math scores started changing. I did an experiment on improving English pronunciation using text to speech. It's really simple, you know. It, it's, uh, I think in the EU that could easily be a usable thing, which is that you speak to a computer and you have a little program which, I mean, you can buy it uh, commercially, which types out what you're saying. And what you do is you, read, you make a child read a paragraph and you see what the computer typed, and you subtract the, the correct, you find out how many errors there are. And then you just tell the children, speak, uh, do whatever you have to do so that the computer understands everything that you're saying. So I did this in Hyderabad in India, and there was a remarkable change in their pronunciation um, as they, you know, by trial and error, removed all the errors. So the speech to text acts as a uh, as an examiner, basically, and they like that because it's not human. Finally, I came to England, and a lot of people ask me, why did, after all these years in India, why did you come to England? Well, the answer is nothing mysterious. It's an answer which drives all of us researchers to various places, money. <laughs> so, so <laughs> there's a large, several million pounds worth of research money came into Newcastle University to improve uh, the quality of education in uh, poorer parts of India. So they called me and said, you're the man who should be doing this. So anyway, my son had grown up and everything, so we sort of packed our bags and said, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and went, came over here to, to England. In England, the reaction to all of this was, it's very fascinating, but you're overstating it when you say children can learn anything by themselves. So I designed an experiment which would change my life completely. At that time, the experiment was designed to fail. I said, I'm going to do an experiment where they don't succeed. And that will establish the limits. So the experiment I made was, can 12-year-old Tamil-speaking Indian children in a village, Tamil being a South Indian language, 
teach themselves the biotechnology of DNA replication in English from a street side computer on their own. <laughs> so, and I said, you know, I'll give them a pretest, they'll get a zero, I'll give them a post test after some time, they'll get another zero, I'll go back to England, they'll say, we need teachers. So off I went, I found a village where they had a hole in the wall computer, the children came running, I said, what have you done? What, have you brought a new game? I said, no, I've brought something very difficult. Here it is. So downloaded material on DNA replication, genetics. So children came and said, how can we understand this? You know, this has got huge English words and chemistry and this and that. So I said, I don't know. That used to be and continues to be my pedagogical method. <laughs> I said, I don't know how you're going to understand it. I just brought it for you and I'm going to leave now. And I left because I knew by then a sentence which I don't know how you'll react to. For all these years, I used to say, look at how clever these children are, how far they've got, in spite of the fact that I wasn't there or a teacher wasn't there. I changed that to look at how far they got because we were not there. Okay? Hard, hard to take, but we have to take it. I've learned it with years and years of observation. Anyway, so in Kuppam, that was the name of the village, we did this experiment and they got a zero. Three months later, the children came back in very quiet. I said, what have you understood? Nothing. So I said, nothing at all. So when did you give up? So they said, no, we never gave up. We look at those screens all the time, trying to understand them, but it's very hard. So at that point, one little girl, luckily for me, she raised her hand and in sort of broken Tamil and English, she said, but apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes genetic disease, we've understood nothing else. <laughs> so, 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 so I said, I said what? I said, what? What did you say? So, so that's what Kukpam looks like. There's those hole in the wall computers. When I pre-tested and post-tested them, they'd gone from a statistical zero to 30%. It was an educational impossibility in a subject that they don't know, which is 20 years ahead of their time, in a language they can't speak properly, uh, in that tropical heat, outdoors without a teacher. It went against everything that the educational theory had to say, but there it was. But I couldn't go back to England with those results because in our traditional Victorian system, 30% is still a fail. So they failed. So how do I get them another 20 marks? without a teacher. Couldn't find a teacher, but I found a young girl who was a good friend of theirs, and I said to her, can you teach them more biotechnology? And she said, no, I didn't have science in school. I have no clue what they're doing with all that, those diagrams. I can't help. So I said, no, you can. What you've got to do is use the method of the grandmother. So she said, what's that? And I told her my arthritis story, and I said that, you know, children, they want to help their grandparents. They just don't know how to say it. So what you do is you stand behind them, and whenever they do anything, you admire them. You just say, how did you do that? When I was a child of your age, I was really silly. I couldn't understand anything. You know, the, I can see some of you nodding who, have the, <laughs> who know the grandmother story. So the grandmother uses a pedagogical method which is very significantly different from the parent or the teacher. They, it's just that they don't voice it, but it is a highly effective method. It uses admiration to produce a spiral of learning inside children. So I asked her to do that, and she did that for two months. The scores jumped to 50%, just because they wanted to hear her say that they're very clever. And I published, and it became a very referenced paper because it showed the impossible happening in education. So I started experimenting all over the world. Um, in England, well, when this got published, and I, I was giving a lecture like this somewhere in England, a school teacher came into the university and met me, and she said, it's fascinating what you're doing with all these children in remote areas, but what about us? So I said, what about you in England? You've got good schools, what's your problem? So she said, come with me to County Durham, 
up of northeast i'll show you some good schools so we went with her and god that was such a eye opener you know i mean that those are very poor areas and they have the remoteness problem they have a problem with alcoholism single parents and all kinds i began to see the west's problems for the first time to see that okay there's a whole new world out there which i didn't know anything about and the children are the main sufferers of that so i went into the school and i started i said i will bring you the hole in the wall experiment upside down inside the school we called it a self organized learning environment so what you do is you go into a classroom it's very simple you take away the computers leave just one or two ask the children some really difficult question and then leave them alone so they have to do what the children in the hole in the wall do which is they have to cluster around each other and so on and so forth and they produce some amazing results so i did this sort of all over this is uh, in hong kong china and so on and came to the conclusion which i told you just earlier in the slide that groups of children have the potential and the capability to teach themselves anything in today's world by themselves it doesn't matter how many years ahead of their time you ask them to do provided you make the question right so i'll i'll just give you an example because this part is very very important you can also do it wrong and it won't work seven year olds in a london school the teacher says to gata i'm going to tell you to do something which you'll never succeed in because the subject i have to teach today is the most boring on the planet i said what's that it's gum health <laughs> for seven year olds so i said okay i'll take it on so when this is a group of seven year olds so I, first thing i said was okay how many people have shaking teeth so you know seven year olds i said i got two i've got one and so on okay so i said you know what when you were born did you have any teeth no no we don't have teeth when when we born okay then what happens we grow teeth and then i said you know something very funny happens the teeth fall out i said yeah and then they grow back yeah and then they last for 40 50 60 years and then they fall out again and they never come back now we've got them okay yeah they never come back so i said yes the question is why does that happen why does it come back the first time doesn't come back the second time okay so they worked on it they figured out everything 40 minutes later it's usually 40 minutes then they present in group i call it a conference i say okay what are the results of your research and so fascinating stuff you know milk teeth are uh, 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 babies grow teeth when they need solid food in order to smash it up but the solid food that babies eat is soft food so they need little teeth and not very strong to to process that when they and they, in their words as they grow up and their stomachs become bigger they need bigger and harder food now those little teeth can no longer take chew that kind of food so they fall off and big strong teeth come out and i said okay and then and then then years and years pass we eat all our food and everything and the gums start to get loose with all that chewing <laughs> and now the teeth fall out but the new ones can't grow because the gums are too loose now to hold them fascinating stuff so so at the end of it i said so guess what if there was a way to keep the gums firm for a little longer the teeth would last a little longer so and i'm waiting with my fingers crossed and they said yes so then i said to the teacher well you can go ahead gum health now <laughs> do you do gum health for the next three hours <laughs> <You know? laughs> because they know what they're talking about it's what they have found it's not what i have told them and so on so so if we put that together if you put the self organized learning environment along with the kuppam result that a granny method can improve the performance you can also see that grannies can be beamed you know in england i put out a uh, appeal once to say if you are a british grandmother if you have broadband and a web camera can you give me 1 hour of your time every week for free in the first 2 weeks i got 200 I know more British grandmothers than anybody else. Okay, so, so they're called the Granny Cloud, and within that there is a way, workforce that was being totally wasted. Forty years of experience, thirty years of experience, sitting in a little village knitting. So I take them, and using Skype, I beam them into the schools where good teachers will not go, and the children love their Skype grannies. they appear full full size on the wall and they talk to them so and they do it for free um because it's only 1 hour a week i have enough of them to do it with uh, and it changes their lives actually 
that's what I didn't expect. They said, you know, you think their lives are changing? It's our lives are changing. So, and they have so many stories. Just the other day, one of them said, I prepared for an hour. I had such a lovely story to read to these children, uh, children in Hyderabad, India, in a slum. So I said, then what happened? They said, are you talking with your laptop? I said, yes. So they said, in that case, get up, take the laptop, and show us what's in your fridge. <laughs> so, so she said, I spent my one hour discussing Tesco. <laughs> and, and, but that's the kind of, it's, it's so rich, you know, incredible. So that's what it looks like. Okay, the granny cloud is 5,000 miles apart. So that's also published stuff. Now comes the harder bits. So we know these things. We just revisit. We know that children can teach themselves to use the internet. We know they can teach themselves almost anything by themselves. We know that given a granny, this process is amplified. We don't know if children can learn to read by themselves. And this is very crucial because for this whole method to work, they must be able to read and understand. How quickly can we reach that goal? I started looking for the numbers and discovered that it's in a pathetic condition. Country after country is saying reading comprehension is very poor. Children are reading below their reading ages. Why is that? I don't know. At the same time, you find two and a half year olds are handling iPads. Wherever I go, I find people telling stories about, oh, my little granddaughter has changed my wallpaper on my phone or something like that. Um, how are they doing this? I think there's a different kind of literacy that we've missed somewhere and we don't have a name for it. Uh, just to give you a quick example, I uh, ha have a, a grandniece who uh, was downloading. She, she very excitedly told me that I have downloaded an app. I said, look, is that your mother's iPad? Said, yes, but don't do that because it costs her money. So she said, no, it's free. So she's two or two and some months. So I said, how do you know it's free? So she points to the, the box. She, she's illiterate. She says, in this box, if there are no number, number things, then it means it's free. <laughs> okay? It's some kind of functional reading, which we don't know anything about, but she's reading. <laughs> so can they learn to read by themselves? I don't know. Um, but I did another study. I did this in Uruguay. Uruguay is interesting because there is no child in Uruguay who doesn't have a laptop. Okay? It's a small country. Every single child has had one for five years. So Uruguay called me and said, can you tell us, has anything happened? Can we justify this expenditure? So I did a measurement <laughs> and discovered very quickly that in Uruguay, the children were reading better in Spanish and English than their counterparts in all the neighboring countries, Argentina, Chile, Brazil, and the United States on national average scores. So why? And then it struck me, well, if a child is constantly reading things off a computer and nobody is telling him whether this is meant for his age or not, isn't it obvious that their reading comprehensions will go up? I'm experimenting with that. And the findings are that doing all this in groups <coughs> is absolutely key to the whole process. Alone, they'll just say, this is too difficult and leave it. In groups, they can read higher than their individual levels. But I have to do these measurements better now. The second thing we don't know is if children can search accurately by themselves, what if they land themselves in trouble? What I have found is very hopeful that when children work in groups, if the groups are allowed to interact with each other and talk freely, if the adult is not there, they can detect doctrine from actual serious material. I don't know how they do it. So I think the sum total of what I've found in these 14 years is that the metacognitive skills of a group are way above the individual levels, way, way above. And that, uh, in, in, in the subject which I know, is called a self-organizing system. That's what a physicist would call it. Hence the conclusion that what we're looking at here is learning in a self-organized system. So we also know that children can do lots of things and that the age at which they do it is getting less and less. 
So what should we do about it? I think curricula around the world needs to be revised and should include the internet, every piece of curriculum, <coughs> somehow. Take a look at this one, the British National Curriculum. And it, one of these points, pupils should be taught to recognize that the past represented and interpreted different ways and to give reasons for this. Can you imagine explaining this to an eight-year-old? I mean, he's going to fall asleep. Okay. Instead of that, in a soul, what I did actually is convert this point into this question. In a museum in the Indian city of Mathura, there is a statue of the great emperor Kanishka. Who was he and why is his head missing? <laughs> you know, Eight-year-olds eight love missing heads. <laughs> okay. so, so they, and the answer to this question is that bit of curriculum, that history can be dif interpreted differently by different people. Okay, so why not convert a curriculum into big, important, interesting questions? We know that young people are like this, and we don't like it. The first bit I can understand that, yes, we all say, yeah, we've all seen this. We've seen this in malls, we've seen this in trains, buses. But the second bit, we don't like it. Why? Why don't we like it? And what if they were to say, we don't like you? <laughs> then then what, is there a problem? So why do we not like it? Because we think that they're wasting time. And we think they're being antisocial. I started asking my adult friends, do you know, do you have data on what they do on those phones when they keep staring at it? And nobody did. Everybody was guessing. Everybody said they're texting all the time. Said, they'll sit next to each other with their best friend, and both of them are texting away at somebody else. This is awful. I said, do you know? And nobody did. So I did a terribly rude thing the last three months. I sat behind them, and I looked at what they were doing. <laughs> You know, I know it's terrible, but somebody has to do it, otherwise where's the data going to come from? Okay? And I saw that they don't text all the time. They search a lot. They continuously learn from these machines. When they do text, it's, it's not any, it, it, it's not banal. I mean, sometimes it is. It's just, it's, oh, so where are you going this evening? That sort of thing. Followed by, in my part of the country, Oh, I'm going to the metro center. What for? There's a new shop which is open. What's it about? Uh, these are boys texting. It's got a quadricopter. What's a quadricopter? And so on and so on. And then I see this banal conversation sliding into instruction. And so what's wrong with that? We didn't have that in our youth. So why do we get annoyed when we see it now? Pedagogy. <coughs> needs to include the use of the internet. Not just for searching, but for talking to each other, for Facebook, Twitter, all of that needs to come in, into the pedagogy. We need their world to come into the classroom. We solve problems like this. Okay. We solve problems like this. When, when your children go out there and join an office, this is how they'll solve problems. Doesn't it remind you of the hole in the wall? So, why would we not train them or encourage them to solve problems this way, collaboratively using the internet? We solve problems like this. This is most common, sitting around a table. When we have a problem, we say, let's call a meeting. When we are in school and we have a problem, we say, don't look at what anybody else is doing. <laughs> okay. What is the point of that? <coughs> okay. I, uh, one last little example. In a school in uh, Newcastle, I did an experiment. I said, uh, give me a group of children that I've never met before, and don't tell me what they were going to do if I didn't come. So it turned out to be a group of 12-year-olds, and they were going to do art, and they were going to do Cezanne's use of light and shade in his watercolors. And I said, you know, quite honestly, I said, I don't know a word of what this means, but I can teach you. <coughs> How? You just tell the children, look, I've got a problem. Your teacher was going to do Cezanne's use of light and shade in her watercolors, in his watercolors. I don't even know how to spell Cezanne, but I don't want to get thrown out of your school, so will you do it for me? And they did it. You know, so I had a little film, but I'm going to skip that. <coughs> However, we don't ask questions like that. We ask questions like this. This is how your this is the end of schooling. 
when you sit in this hall and you answer this question. Examinations need to focus on the internet and collaboration for problem solving and decision making. Example, here's a sample GCSE question. According to Darwin's theory of evolution, how do new species evolve? <laughs> by artificial selection, by natural selection, by unnatural selection. I think it's a most terrible, stupid question to start with, first of all. So I changed that question. I changed that question to this. Why do we have five fingers and toes on each hand? Why not any other number? Use the internet and mutual discussion to develop a paragraph on this subject. Isn't there a much more rational way to ask that question than the multiple choice, uh, you know, which obviously any, anybody who has access to the internet can solve in two seconds. But this one, it, it doesn't have an answer. It takes a lot of discussion. So we need to change that. Success is still defined by the ability to write nicely in a nice handwriting, we're using the correct spelling, and hopefully using an obsolete device, the fountain pen. <laughs> <laughs> we need to change the definition of that one. So this is going to be hard, gentlemen. Handwriting, spelling, grammar, multiplication tables. We have to take each one and dispassionately see if they're required. If not, we have to chuck them out. And handwriting is my current target. Should people not know how to write by hand? It hurts to say it, you know. So, can I say this for my own child, that he will never know how to write by hand? I said, well, no, I'll teach him how to write by hand, but I won't bother with spending years on how good his handwriting is. That should become a hobby, like knitting. <laughs> Spelling. Uh, when you have a spell checker, there's a, again, a, my generation's misunderstanding. If you use a spell checker, you'll never learn how to spell. It's absolutely untrue. Nobody's tested it. I think assistive technology teaches. You misspell a word once, twice, the third time you don't misspell it. So the assistive technology can actually teach if you allow it inside the school. Similarly for grammar, grammar checkers, um, multiplication tables, I mean, that, that takes the cake. 17 times tables, that's considered life skill. <laughs> Whatever for. <laughs> so why would things that a generation 200 years ago invented, who was a very clever generation, and said 1 to 10 into 1 to 10, this table needs to be inside your head because otherwise you won't be able to do things on the spot. They were brilliant. And they would have laughed at us if we showed them a calculator and said, even now we teach your method. And they would have said, are you out of your mind or what? But we, we decided that these are wonderful skills. If you answer an examination using Shakespeare's English, you will fail. If you answer an examination using texting language, you've had it. But if you answer in English in 1930s English, you are a good boy. Who's decided that year? What for? When are we going to change that? You know? Texting language, we hate it. We hate it. I, every time I try to write it and I hesitate to write it, I don't like it. And then I think to myself, we made a little gadget with an awful keyboard, and the generation we made it, we were selling it to, my generation built that and sold it to the younger generation. Instead of throwing it into the waste paper basket, they invented a new language for it. We should applaud them for doing that instead of berating them. This was the office until maybe 70 years ago. This is what an office used to look like. This is what an office used to look like with the supervisor moving up and down. And now, so you had to prepare children for these offices and you prepared them like this. Is it clear now what's wrong? We're 200 years behind. So obsolescence of ideas, skills, methods, knowledge need to be factored into learning methods, curricular examinations. And I think the simple trick is if you start with examinations, it drives everything else. When teachers are friends, not sages, not guides, if they're just friends like the granny, then they can roll curriculum, pedagogy, and examination all together into one. 
we don't need to separate them. You know that question like, why do we have five fingers on our hands? It could be an examination question, it could be a curriculum, it could be knowledge of a lesson on evolution. It could be all of that rolled into one. And if teachers were friends, then schooling can be forever. Why do we need to box it between the ages of five and 18? How about a schooling system where until the age of five, you go to school for one hour a day. Five to 12, you go for four hours a day. 12 to 18, you go for seven hours a day. And after 18, for the rest of your life, there is one day every month when you go back to school. You know, the well, school was fun, so why just take it away, why block it off? So I'm building something called a school in the cloud. It's, it's a very simple thing. It it's, looks like a cyber cafe for children. Uh, it's a teacherless facility. There will be a human supervisor, but uh, she doesn't teach. It's usually an elderly woman who looks after health and safety. Um, and there's a big screen. If the children want, they can get a Skyped in granny. They have a whole list of which granny or which grandfather is good at what. And by the way, they're not all grannies. There's young men and women also in there. And uh, so they can call these people. And like one child put it to me in India after a lot of coaxing, I said, why do you like this? Isn't it so much better to have a real person? Why do you like this person on the screen? And then in a very embarrassed voice, he said, you can switch them off. <laughs> so, so, so I'm building them in some really remote places. I'm going to collect the data. And I'm going to compare them with two schools in England where I'm building them also, up in the northeastern England. And in three years' time, we'll have data on whether it's possible to roll curriculum, pedagogy, examinations into one, whether it's possible to have non-physical teachers, huge numbers of them. So a school can say that I can use 600 teachers. Uh, and where does that take the children? What does it do to their psychological health and to their performance? And Ted calls them schools in the cloud. So that's it. I'm sorry, I've already taken too much time. <laughs>